Please remain standing as we read God's Word. Open your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. Probably one of the most familiar verses that we turn to if we're going to talk about precious promises of God. 2 Peter, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And shall we look to our Lord now in another word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee, Lord, thanking you for your love to us, and your mercy and grace and watch care over us. We thank thee, our Father, for the privilege that we have to come to the house of the Lord. And as we have assembled now, Lord, I ask that you would open up our hearts, ears, and minds to be open and receptive to thy word. That if there be any here today that are lost and undone without the Lord Jesus Christ as their only and all-sufficient Savior, that this would be the day of salvation. And Father, I want to pray for those that are, that are not here. I want to ask, Lord, for, for them to be able to come at the next appointed time. I pray for Shirley this morning, and I pray for the Wells family, and I ask, Lord, that you would be with them and that you would bless in the diagnosis and the situations in his life. And Father, I want to pray, and I want to ask that you would be with those that know you not as Savior. And Father, those that have come and they have heard the Word of God, that, Lord, that they would continue to come and that they would continue to hear the Word of God. We know, Father, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And Father, I want to pray for souls, and I want to pray that you would be pleased to save. And Father, we know that only you are able to save. I thank thee, our Father, for this church. I thank you for the love of Grace Baptist Church. I thank you for the prayers of our brothers and our sisters towards me and towards our family. I thank thee, our Father, that they pray for us, that they're concerned about us, and that they, they uh, are concerned about the things of the Lord. I thank Thee, our Father, for the prayers that are prayed on my behalf to keep me strong in the Word of God. And so, Father, I, I ask that You would continue to bless us as a church, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, Father, I do want to, again, praise You and thank You for allowing us this time to come together. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May we see you. So probably not big surprise on the title. We'll title the message, Exceeding Great and Precious Promises. Verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Given unto us great and precious promises. Exceeding great and precious promises. As we get started, unfortunately, I think, we have a bad perception of promises in our minds, in our heart of hearts. And the reason that we have a bad perception on promises in general is because of the amount of broken promises offered in today's world. Broken promises from loved ones. Broken promises from friends, from co-workers. Broken promises from within our families from our government, and so on and so forth. I feel fairly confident that everyone in this place this morning 
or even listening over the internet, has been the recipient of a promise that was not kept. And I would go on to say that everyone here has made a promise that you did not keep, whether it was intentional or not. And because of all of this, negative feelings about promises have arrived or, ar or arisen. People then are losing faith in the promises of God. Not saying that it's right, because God's promises, as we'll talk about today, are true and right. But because we are inundated with broken promises all around us, our mind tends to go towards the fact that if it's so easy for us to break a promise, how can I trust the promises of God? People say, why would God be any different? Well, beloved, it is different. God's promises are true, and they are real, and God will never, ever break His promises to His children. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 20. We have a lot of scripture today. So, 2 Corinthians, this is just kind of the beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen unto the glory of God. All the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen. And amen, of course, meaning so be it, or as it is. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Romans 4, 21. And the Word of God says, And being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to perform. God is able to keep His promises. God is able to keep His promises. It has been said that there are over 7,000 promises contained in the Word of God. I have never counted them all personally, but I know this, that every promise God ever made, He will bring to pass. Every promise that God has ever made, He will bring to pass. God cannot lie. God will never be caught in a lie. In the book of or Hebrews 6.18. Hebrews 6.18. God's word says this. Uh, that was 7. That's why it didn't look right. 6.18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie... We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. God's promises are true. And so, beloved, may you be careful. And I think we all need to be careful to never make a promise that we do not intend to keep. I try to be very, very careful not to use the word promise if I have any doubt at all that I will not be able to do it. I am careful not to make promises to my wife, to my children, to adults, and even to this church unless I know that I will be able to follow through. And this is very, very important because again, since we as a culture have broken so many promises, people don't trust them anymore and do not trust the promises of God. So let us make a commitment that we will only use the word promise if we know that we'll be able to do it. Now, five times in these two epistles, Peter mentions, it, mentions promises that are precious to the people of God. 
So let's just go through the epistles, 1 and 2 Peter. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, and you will find that our trials are precious. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, one of our precious promises is that of trials. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Now, I'm not standing up here as an expert on the trials in your life. Nor am I making light of any trials of your faith that God has seen you through. But I am saying, and what we see here in the Word of God, is that Peter, under the inspiration of God, tells us that the trials of life are very precious things. I think it's safe to say that none of us wake up in the morning and say, I'm hoping to go through a severe trial today. Something that will truly test my faith. But when we go through them, and when they come, I want you to know that when a trial comes, God already knows all about it, and He has the power to bring you through it. Notice that Peter refers to the refining process that is used to purify gold. When we are put to the test in life, it has the effect of removing the impurities from our life. Often it is the trials of life that bring us closer to God. Again, I am not making light of any kind of trial or anything that may be a trial in someone's life, but I have been around long enough and even counseled some or been around some that have lost dear loved ones, husbands or wives or even their children. And they say, through that, they have a closeness to God that I may not even know what it's like having not gone through those specific trials. When, and if, certainly if she was here, I would be saying this, but when Sister Teresa speaks about the loss of one of her children, the unexpected loss of one of her children, all the times are still hard. But she talks about how close she is to the Lord. Or how close the Lord was in her life at that time. When gold is tried, it is heated, it is tried with fire to remove the impurities. And so our trials, God's Word says, are more precious than of gold that perishes. Four things to think about as we are in the valleys of life, and life is a cycle of mountaintop experiences and valleys, isn't it? We're reminded of several great truths in the valley that we often forget when everything is smooth and okay when we're on the mountaintop. And it seems sometimes when we're in the valley is when we remember some of these great promises. But beloved, when we're in the trial, when we're in the valley, we're often reminded, as God's Word says, that He is always with us. In the book of Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5. God's Word says to us here, Let your conversation be without covetousness, 
And be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So in the trial and in the storm, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are His, is with us. In John chapter 6, we're reminded of the story of the disciples on the, store, on the sea during the storm. In verses 16 through 20, we'll read these here. And when even was now come, the disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty, I'm sorry, when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us in the storm. Beloved, we need to remember that all areas of our lives, God already knows about. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. We're reminded that our trials are helping us to grow in the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many renown to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When talking to people, the trial of our faith certainly can seem like an eternity. The pain or the trial or the struggle that we're going through could seem to last forever, but in the light of eternity, in the comparison of being with God, our Lord and Savior, forever and ever, it is yet but for a moment. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then the other, the last thing that our precious trials remind us of is that when times are tough, as we said a moment ago in Romans 8, 28, God is still good. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. The trials and the valleys of life are not necessarily fun. And we would rather not have to go through them. But when we have gone through the valley and we come out on the other side, most of the time we're stronger in our faith than we were before we went in. All right. Secondly, in 1 Peter 1.19, we talk about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Hmm. I know where Peter is. Just keep there we go. 1 Peter 1 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as a of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
having spoke about the blood of Christ not too long ago, we understand that the reality of this message as we talk about the blood of Christ is really an entire message on its own. And so for the sake of the message at hand, I do not wish to speak about the precious blood of Christ for the rest of the message, but to remind us of how precious His blood truly is. There are some, and there is a movement to take the blood of Christ out of the Word of God and out of the hymns that we sing. There are many today who would like to preach a dry, cleaned out plan of salvation that contains no references to the blood of Jesus Christ. But without blood, there is no remission of sin. The shedding of blood. The shedding of Christ's blood. And Christ's blood is so precious. It, was, it is 100% perfectly pure and sinless. It's only by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. It is the precious blood of Jesus that covers our sins. This morning, please understand that all here today have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as it says in the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So we were dead in our sins. So beloved, There is nothing but the blood of Jesus that can save us from our sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ can redeem us from our sins. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was the full payment for our sin. The precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ is a once and for all covering for our sin. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 12 through 14. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. And then the third one is, and, and it's, I'm just preaching it along with this part of the message, is that the Savior is precious. His blood is precious and Christ is precious. 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, we're reading about the precious promises of God as found here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, the precious Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered our entire sin debt when He shed His blood at the cross. 
And although we do not deserve His grace, He gives us saving grace. Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ is precious. Which brings us into this next one here, number four. The precious faith. Second Peter chapter 1, this was the first verse in our text, verse 1. Precious faith. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Precious faith. Many of you have grown up hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ, have grown up hearing about the cross, have grown up hearing about the precious blood of Jesus Christ, have grown up hearing about the plan of salvation made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think often we may take for granted, if you will, what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and fail to realize how special and precious faith in Christ truly is. You see, our faith is precious in Jesus Christ because it is the only one that is valid in the eyes of God. Let me explain. For there is none other name given under, given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not of works that we have done. It is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it is only about the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the people involved in all the other religious systems in the world are being deceived by the false doctrine. There is one and only one means of salvation, and it is through faith by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. For we are His workmanship created unto Christ Jesus, unto good works which God, uh, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Not by works. It is a precious faith to believe and to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is precious because it is all of grace. The message that Jesus Christ died for the lost. He gave His life for sinners. By His grace, we receive it. The message of the Word of God, the message of the Gospel, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, it changes us. It changes our standing with God. It changes our desires in this life. And saving grace, the precious faith, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. You want to know why we are able to have so much fun around God's children? Because those that have been saved by the grace of Almighty God have like precious faith with us. But this faith is something that begins and ends with God. Man of his own will does not seek God. God seeks us. Man does not initiate salvation. God initiates. It is God that saves us. Man did not provide the means of salvation. God did. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans 5, 8. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And then the last one that we'll cover is how in our text in 2 Peter 1, 4, we see that there are certainly exceeding great 
and precious promises. 2 Peter 1 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The exceeding great and precious promises of God. Again, over 7,000. It's been said that there are over 7,000. How could we even begin to talk about all the precious promises of God? God promises so many glorious things to His children, and I trust that today God has spoken to you as we've gone through His Word. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God, and shall we stand together to be dismissed in a word of prayer.